Hello. Ah, hello. This is a microphone that I'm using now. Um, let's see. Um, thank you guys for coming to the conference today. Uh, it's awesome to see so many friendly faces. I don't see any unfriendly ones, at least not right now, so that's really sweet. Um, uh, I'm Gretchen McKenzie Trost, and uh, I'm the director of outreach for Revolve, and uh, I just want to say again a big thanks to all of our volunteers today. Everybody wearing a pink shirt just worked their butts off. It was great. Um, I'm really proud of everybody. Uh, thanks to the Marquette Makers Project. Um, they organized the whole vendor experience. Thanks to all the vendors, all of our sponsors. Um, and we there's four of us who organized the main event. Will you guys all stand up so everyone can clap for you? <laughs> we have Chad McKinney, Sean Pitts, Keith Ellis, myself. Um, we're really glad that we got to do this for you. Um, this is a group of amazing people, and I am so glad you're all here. Um, so today I'll be talking with the legendary Steve Albini. Uh, if you don't really know who he is, he's worked as a musician, an engineer, a producer, and a music journalist. Um, he's worked with an impressive roster of artists at his studio, Electrical Audio, um, to name a few of a really long list. Uh, the Pixies, the Jesus Lizard, Silkworm, PJ Harvey, Nirvana, the Breeders, Low, Slint, uh, Songs Ohio, the Stooges, uh, Jimmy Page, and Robert Plant. Um, and again, you should go on Wikipedia and look at all the artists he's worked with because it's a really cool list. Um, and Steve is also an incredible musician in his own right, uh, most notably with his bands Big Black and Shellac. Um, so let's bring Steve out with a fancy song and... <laughs> No, no rush. We have nowhere to be. Um, uh, nice. <laughs> That's a really good look for you. I hope you start wearing that more often. I'm, I'm very comfortable in this hat. Yeah. Not everyone looks good in a Stormy Cromer. You look great. Thank you. I don't believe you, but thank you. <laughs> um, well, I'm glad you, you've got a Stormy Cromer. You're pretty much an honorary youper now at this point. You've walked around in the snow while wearing a Stormy Cromer. That's all we do most of the time anyways. So um, uh, I have a bunch of questions for you, but uh, I kind of want to start small. Uh, what does your daily creative routine look like? Uh, do you have any habits that get you in a productive and inspired mindset? Um, because my existence is kind of uh, bifurcated between the creative part of my life, which is being in a band, and then the earning a living part of my life, which is a, the, more of the day-to-day -day thing, um, I have a... I have a, a trait or a skill, I guess, where I can completely disregard the parts of my brain or the parts of my personality that are not useful in the moment. So while I'm in the studio working for somebody else on their record, uh, I'm essentially not aware of my own creative process. So like I'm never working on somebody else's record and thinking about how it, what they're doing might apply to my band's music or my creative drive at all. Uh, I, I can sort of shut down the parts of my thinking that are not useful. And I, I would think that um, anything other than the task at hand is not useful, so I shut off those parts of my thinking. 
for example, um, when I'm just hanging out with my friends or listening to music at home or whatever, I can be quite specific about my tastes, about things that I like and don't like. Um, I don't like most things. And, and the things that I like, I generally like uh, because they surprise me or because they are, um, in one way or another, uh, outside of my experience and outside of my expectation. When something is happening, and it's happening precisely the way I imagined it would happen, that rarely holds my interest. But when I'm trying to follow a thread and I'm constantly being battered by surprises and left turns, then that forces me to engage, and I, that's when I'm the most stimulated by what I'm w listening to or what I'm engaging in, whether it's a book or a movie or whatever. When I'm in the studio working for somebody else, I'm try, I try very hard to sublimate my tastes as a listener so that I can be a sympathetic um, partner to the people that are working in the studio and so that they don't feel like I'm constantly running interference between them and their expectations or their normal methods. Like if somebody wants to come into the studio and make a distinctly dull, predictable, ordinary record, they should be allowed to do that without me trying to convince them to put like duck quacks on it or whatever, you know? <laughs> sure. So um, when you ask about my daily creative routine, my daily creative routine is suppressing all of my creative impulses and trying to sublimate my tastes as a listener and become a cooperative partner with the people that I'm working with on whatever scale and, and on whatever terms they need for the moment. Uh, I like to think that everyone who's going through the effort of making a recording has thought about their process and thought about their art in a serious way and that they know what they're trying to accomplish. And the last thing they need is somebody introducing doubt or um, trying to run interference on that plan. And um, I feel like one of the reasons that I've survived, and uh, I'm very old, uh, one of the reasons I've survived in the, in the trade of a recording engineer is that people of many disparate styles can come into our studio and get a respectful, accurate, flattering recording made. It's not like, you know, we're, we're good with heavy metal, but don't bring an acoustic guitar in there or whatever. It's like, I feel like the, the fact that our, that the studio is, is multi-capable and that I try to be an example to, to the rest of our engineers to be capable and willing to do anything means that we're, we will be a resource for everybody of any type. And in a sort of a general sense, we're participating on a social level in the music scene in Chicago and in the world, to be honest, without... Um, having an agenda of trying to promote or, or canonize a particular idiom or a particular kind of music. Fantastic. Okay. Is, <laughs> or if, if what you were asking is what, how do I tune my guitar, that's a different question. <laughs> but. Um, yeah, do you, do you feel like um, by you kind of holding back your creativity for most of the work week, do you feel like that when you actually get a chance to work on your passion projects that it's over the top, like it's all of that saved up or is it just kind of come and go? I mean, honestly, it's, it feels the same. By the same, I mean, when I was 19 years old, I had the same relationship with my band and with my music, meaning I would go to school or work or whatever was required of me. And then in my spare time, I would work on my band and my music and I would be immersed in it, you know? Mm -hmm. But then, you know, I have to get up in the morning and go to work, and it, the, you know, you, you don't serve either the music or your, op, your uh, occupation by sitting there frustrated, pining away for wishing I could not be here 
and doing something else. You, I mean, it, there's no value in that. So I, I, just, I just shut down that kind of thinking. And honestly, it feels exactly the same. There's a, within our band, the band is called Shellac of North America, and within our, within the band, we talk about the way we proceed as a band and the fact that all of us use the spare time of our lives to work on the band stuff. Uh, and that inevitably means that the time scale just is exaggerated for us. Like what a conventional band where you're practicing three nights a week and playing four shows a month and do an album a year, like a conventional band like that, um, they can get an awful lot done in a sh relatively short period of time uh, on a calendar basis because they're meeting up a lot, they're working on their material all the time. And for us, we might only get together physically in the same room three times a year, you know, and then... So our time with each other and our time to work on music is limited. So our, the, everything just becomes really elastic. And, and a week for shellac, meaning a week's worth of work for a normal band environment, might take six months or nine months or a year. So that week of our energy in shellac time is in calendar time, nine months or a year or something like that. So when we talk about within the band, like we're gonna need a few weeks to work on this, what we mean is it could be, it could be a decade or more before <laughs> we get something together. And uh, just as an example, we have a spate of new songs. And when I say new songs, I mean songs that we have written and worked up since the last time we released a record of all of our then current material. We have this spate of new songs. Most of them we've been playing in our live sets for the last three to five years, but they're still the new songs, you know, and uh, we are, we still consider them open for discussion, like arrangement questions, thematic questions, tempo, dynamics, all that stuff is still quite fluid in those songs because they're still young in shellac time, they're still young for us, you know. There was a, there's a, are you familiar with uh, Fermat's equation about like, why, about the population of the universe? Like why, if there's the oh. probability of there being so many, was it Fermat? Fermi. I forget who I'm it is. I'm not familiar with it's either. Fermi? <laughs> the Fermi paradox is that mathematically there should be many civilizations in the universe. Why haven't we communicated with them, right? Mm -hmm. And there are all of these potential answers for that question, which is that, you know, that it takes so long that no civilization survives long enough to communicate with another civilization or that there are these galactic scale events that extinguish certain civilizations before they've had a chance to communicate with other civilizations, whatever it is. And um, part of it is that there, given that our lifespans are sort of what determine our experience, like if you conceive of something when you're young and you don't get to experience it by the time you're old and die, then it essentially is impossible, it basically doesn't happen, right? But if there are organisms in the universe that have lifespans that are many multitudes of our lifespan, then conceivably they could experience the sort of things that we'll never get to experience, like communication with each other in distant parts of the, of the universe, right? Um, so shellac operates as one of those alien beings where the time scale is just extraordinarily long by human terms, but for us as an intergalactic traveling super being, yeah, yeah. it's the blink of an eye, you know. Right, yeah, of course, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm very, very embarrassed that I confused Fermat and Fermi at the beginning of that this is a, story. It's a safe space, no okay. one's judging you here. <laughs> um, well, when you work on a project with others, like your bandmates in Shellac, um, like what, do you have a set of values that kind of govern your creative process? Like the things you look for in music, things that surprise you, like how do you surprise yourself? Yeah, that's, um, well, when we started the band, we had a, a, some sort of, we, we just for, reached a consensus about how we wanted to conduct ourselves within the band. And we committed to a few core ideas that we've just been battering ever since. And the band has been going for more than 25 years now, and the core ideas have remained. The, w the principal core idea is that we would have no paradigm, like no 
archetype of music that we were trying to do. We were just going to make music that engaged us and that kept us on our toes and that made it seem in, worthwhile to do. Like we, we, a long time ago, we decided that we would never play a song pro forma. We would only ever play m music that was, you know, whether, like if we wrote a song and it engaged us for a brief period and we played it for a bit, then there's, if it loses its charm for some reason because we feel like we've exhausted it, then there's no reason to play it just mechanically because it's part of the repertoire. There's just no reason to do it. So we would only play material that we were engaged by, directly engaged by. Um, that it would just be the three of us playing our three instruments. Like we, we didn't want to fall into the trap that weakens so many bands where they like exhaust an original pool of creative energy and so they just start attaching ornaments on their music and you know like adding extra sounds and adding extra people and and just forcing an eclecticism onto their music yeah. that uh, obscures the fact that their ideas have run thin right so we we, we didn't want to do that if we got to a point where we felt like we'd run out of steam, we intend to just stop. I mean, given the time scale that we work on, I think that's, un <laughs> yeah, you know, it's very likely, <laughs> very unlikely to happen soon. But even if it were to happen soon, in finger quotes, that could take years, you know, right. <laughs> for us to get to the point where we actually sort the laundry and we're, you know, we're done. But uh, I just used finger quotes there. I have a friend, Tim Midget from the Mint Mile and formerly the uh -huh. band Silkworm. He, he uh, uses three fingers for his finger quotes to indicate extra irony. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> I do love the finger quote as a means of uh, intellectually distancing myself from oh, a yeah. concept. Where I, so I can say something, but you all don't have to think that I believe it when I do that. <laughs> it's perfect. Yeah. Um, well, uh, back, kind of back to your bandmates in shellac, um, Bob Weston and Todd Trainer. Um, what qualities do you admire and seek out in collaborators like them? Um, Todd and I became friends a long, long time ago, and then we started playing together in a kind of an accidental way. We were both sort of we were both tapped to play in the backing band of a mutual friend, and then we just really enjoyed playing together, and so we started playing together again after that project died a natural death, we, kept, we carried on playing together, him and I. And then that, that be, it became obvious that we were going to be a band at some point. Um, and I had known Bob from his previous band, the Volcano Sons, and we got along well and we had some, a, a lot of other stuff in common, like we knew a lot of the same people. He was a recording engineer. He had a degree in electronics, which made him useful uh, uh, at when I was building a studio in Chicago, it seemed like a natural thing to invite him to come to Chicago and play with me and Todd, and then as an aside, he could also work in the studio and help help with the design and installation of the studio. All that stuff worked a treat. Uh, we've just gotten along famously ever since. What I admire about them is that uh, each of us can be trusted to do his own thing within this sort of framework of the band without the others having to do any kind of guard duty, you know? Like, I don't have to suggest drum beats or uh, bass patterns to those two, and they don't have to suggest stuff to me because we're we have this kind of a filter, an internal filter, where if something is not working out, it, we all immediately recognize it and just bail. Every now and again, we'll try to force the issue on a sort of a thematic note, like, we had this idea, this one song. We wanted to do a song that was kind of like the Misfits or the na or Naked Ray Gun, where like, er, you know, it was like, fairly straightforward rock playing from beginning to end, like you could tell where you were going in the song by the way the song was going, and then, and so we we tried to do a song like that, like f way more than it probably deserved, and then we just gave up on it, because it was ob we were obviously bad at it, right? So rather than pursue something that was an obvious dead end, we just 
gave up, you know, and we've got a litany of discarded material like that where somebody had a bright idea and we pursued it for a while and then it just fell on its flat on its face and we just gave up. Um, and I think that nobody gets hung up on these things as a little darling, like, oh, but I've got this guitar riff that I really must use, you know, um, and then it puts other people in this sort of a defensive posture of being like, all right, well, we'll indulge him with this fucking thing he wants to do and then... <laughs> You know, and then when it's my turn, I'm going to stick a stake in the ground about my little thing that I want to do. Like, we just don't have those arguments. It yeah, just that would get out of control you know. really fast. <laughs> like, I know of other bands that are sort of peer group where, like, if one guy has written a song, like, he dictates to the band how that song is going to come out. Mm -hmm. And then there, then it sort of becomes an informal sort of turf war of, like, well, we're doing this album, and you've got five songs on it, but I've only got three songs on it. You know, that just doesn't seem fair. And, you yeah. know, that, that sort of thing. I, I, I know you guys are, I can sense the, the groan and the cringe from the crowd, but that, those are the kind of yeah. conversations that bands have internally all the time. We just wanted to avoid all of that. We didn't want to have any kind of, any kind of authorship of our music was going to be communal. We weren't going to have any, like, you know, oh, that's one of his, so we have to do it, you know, because we, otherwise we don't get enough of his in the set, you know, that kind of thing. So that you, your bandmates are able to set aside their egos or ha build a collective ego, maybe. Yeah, I think, I, I mean, I think any musician that, that any, any musician that, like, deigns to perform in front of other people has a sense right. of identity about their playing or their style or oh, their, yeah. what they want to do, and that it comes with... A, a notion of an ego, like there's mm -hmm. just no way to divorce those yeah. two. Like you know, I've, I've got this wicked guitar lick that I really like, that makes me better than someone who doesn't have that <laughs> wicked wicked guitar lick. You know, like uh, that's just totally yeah. normal. Or like, you know, I've invented this this hot fill that I'm going to put in the drum beat, mm -hmm. and that elevates me for the moment above someone who didn't have that hot fill. Like I think that's a natural right. thing in the create part of the creative process is the sort of satisfaction of having come up with something, right? So, um, so th there's an element of ego it, just yeah. in bothering to be in a band on stage, right? right? And uh, I occasionally see criticisms of bands as like people are sort of offended by the pretense of some performers where they're like adopting a perf persona on stage or whatever like that. But I mean, there's a degree of pretense in just charging a cover, you know? Right, yeah. <laughs> and they're just like, yeah, what we're doing is good enough for you to have to spend $6. Right. Like, that's, <laughs> I think, I, I, I just don't see those as black and white distinctions, mm -hmm. really. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's great. Um, so if you run out of questions, um, somebody stopped me outside and gave me oh. a, some questions. You drew a little cartoon. I, I was wondering who drew that cartoon. gave me a list of cartoons. Oh, that's there. great. You don't have to. I'm not obliging you to ask those questions. Cool. Um, I have a lot more questions, okay, but good. I think we have a lot of time left. I forgot to wear a watch today, so we're on shellac time now. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I do have a question about uh, growing up. Okay. Um, so you grew up in Missoula, Montana. Primarily. I moved, Primarily. I moved around a lot when I was a kid, but uh, we settled in Montana and sort of did, I did all my adolescence. and I Formative left for, years, kind of? Yeah, exactly. All the important you know, Coming Little League age. and First Girlfriend and all that sure. sort of stuff. That all happened in Missoula. Yeah. What was her name? <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, well, I don't I want to get her kicked out of the Daughters of Job or whatever. Oh, sure. <laughs> um, well, Marquette has the same size population now that um, Missoula did when you were younger. Okay. Um, and we have a really small and supportive music scene that does make it fairly easy for younger people to feel welcome and get involved. Did you have a similar experience like that as a kid? Was there a good scene growing up for you? Um, I didn't really, I wasn't really aware. There probably was a, a music scene of some kind. Um, I, I sort of came of age in punk rock, when, which was a kind of a rejection of all the conventions of the, of the sort of established musical scenes of the time. So if there were a tra like a, a tradition or like a, an in-group of musicians, I would not have been in it and I would not have wanted to have been in it. <laughs> sure. So, um, but 
the band, I, I formed a band after discovering punk rock. I formed a band in Missoula, and we played a couple of house parties in a frat house and that sort of thing. And, and it was a, you know, predictable disaster. And That's fun, then though, I right? left town to go to college in <laughs> Chicago. And so I don't, but after I left, um, there did seem to develop a pretty, comfort, pretty significant local music scene that, um, you know, I sort of dropped in on occasionally afterwards, like when my band would be on tour, we would play there and we would see that there was, obviously there was like a, a welcoming tradition there and there was like a pretty strong local identity to the music scene there, which I admired, you know. Fantastic. Oh, well, speaking of identity, um, like your records, your personal style, you wear a lot of jumpsuits, <laughs> or more than some people. Um, you have a strong individual aesthetic and sound. Um, can you give us some insight into your influences? Um, I, I'm a profoundly lazy person. Sure. So I don't change uh, much. Um, and so, for example, I, I, I started as a teenager, I, I was very comfortable in Levi's and t-shirts, and I, so I have just persisted and been allowed to persist wearing Levi's and t-shirts for my life. Uh, that's about it as far as the style is concerned. Um, uh, I've had short hair for most of my life. I started to feel uncomfortable with all the fascists having short hair. Oh. So for the last couple of years, I sort of let my hair grow, and it... Uh, it was a failure. Um, I waited until my mid-50s to grow my hair out, so I had none of the life skills necessary to deal with long hair. <laughs> like, if I had the window down in the car, my hair would blow into my face, and it was just a constant irritation, and so then I capitulated and I started wearing a cap, and that's terrible. So uh, then I was just one of those guys with long hair under a ski cap in the dead of summer. You know, it was just fucking ridiculous. So I gave up uh, at the end of the, I gave up the summer and I just got, just got my hair cut short again. And I'll probably maintain a messy short haircut because if it's tidy, then you start to look like a Nazi. So, yeah. and, I, and I don't particularly care what other people think of me, like especially if they're mistaken about me being a Nazi, I don't particularly yeah. care. <laughs> I just don't want a Nazi to look across the room and see me and think that he's, like, that he's found a safe space. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. the opposite of what I think everyone in this room wants. Yeah. <laughs> There's a good uh, anti-Nazi theme tonight. I'm really grateful for Gabino and Tony starting that. <laughs> um, so do you think the Stormy Cromer might be your new winter look? Uh, I don't, I do, I love the convertible nature of it, where you can get the flaps down if your ears get cold. I think that's great. Yeah. The, the bill, I have to say, the bill does make me slightly uncomfortable. Well, it might help yeah. if it's really sunny out, but we're out of luck for a couple months on that front, I guess. Um, so, going in an entirely different direction, you've always been an advocate for artists' independence from labels and firm in the stance that the music industry exploits artists. Um, how well, well, that was true for the first, say, 70 or 80 years of the music industry, when the music industry was the record business, you know. Right. Um, but it's not the record business anymore, and now there are a million ways where people can divorce themselves from the traditional power structures and do their own thing, like literally their own thing. Like, if you wanted to have an enterprise where you just like made music and put it out under different preposterous names and only ever disseminated it on your Bandcamp page or whatever, like you can totally do that now. Mm -hmm. Like you have the, an access to a worldwide audience for whatever fucking ridiculous thing you want to do. No one can stop you now. Previously there were a lot of way, things, a lot of hurdles that you had to jump in order to get access to an audience. Um, and when I say access to an audience, I mean, yeah. If people are interested in your shit, they can find it, right? It, it used to be that even if you were a, you know, obsessive fan of something, it could be a years-long endeavor to try to track down the one existing article, you know, that the artifacts were, were where the music was, and now the artifacts are secondary. Like, 
bands put out records, and I think it's great that people are still interested in building a collection of music that is embodied in phonograph records. I think that's great, you know. Um, but you can hear music every day of your life without ever buying a record, you know. Yeah. So uh, um, I, I, I was at war with the, uh, the music industry because the music industry was exploitative and, uh, and pernicious and s generally sought to subvert anyone who was operating outside of its norms, right? But now those norms are trivial and they don't, they don't mean anything, you know. No. Uh, so there's a there's a nice uh, a nice I guess you'd call it satisfaction in having lived long enough to see all of the, the pernicious evils of the music business sort of collapse from their own hollow you know emptiness yeah. and, and see a, a new paradigm emerge where anybody who wants to can make himself or herself available to the world and the world can respond but you but you're not obliged to operate through any of these existing power structures it used to be that if you wanted to sell a significant number of records or if you wanted to be heard and by that I mean if you wanted to be heard by an audience of unlimited capacity you would need to get your records into chain stores you'd need to get your records played on popular radio programs and things like that all of those things were subject to corruption and bribery and payola and um, prejudice. Like an ex there was a, a pretty severe um, racial and cultural barrier between some retail outlets and some music. And all of that's gone now. And I think that's awesome, you know. So I, I have been suspicious throughout my career of the, the, in the norms of the industry and the players in the industry who I saw as a destructive influence but now I feel like, mo by and large, they're irrelevant. And, you know, the bands that come through our studio now to make records are recording music that means the world to them. They're not there out of an obligation to a record label that has told them they must deliver an album, you know. And there, so there's a, there's a qualitative leap as well. Like, no one is making... No one is spending the money to do a recording session for something that is just a perfunctory obligation or something that they're not committed to. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's also great, you know. Yeah, it's all serious. Um, how do you feel about streaming in general? Uh, I mean, I don't, I don't make use of streaming very much myself. Um, like, I'll open up YouTube or Bandcamp or something if, if I'm curious about something that someone has suggested to me and I'll get a taste of it but I, it's not my normal listening habit is listening to streaming services and I think streaming as a, in the way that they've got these sort of subscription models and advertising and stuff like that I feel like that's all a very fragile temporary stopgap measure um, and eventually something is going to come around that makes it makes that, that method unnecessary. Like, I can imagine uh, an app on my phone that would scour the internet for whatever is of interest to me and then play it for me without me having to be a member of any of these services, without me having to be, to, to buy license to listen to anything, uh, that just having an autonomous thing that would find it somewhere and play it for me. I think that's a perfectly feasible next generation from, next one up from, from streaming, you know. And I don't see any way to prevent something like that. Uh, and so I feel like streaming is like the last desperate attempt of a hidebound music industry to maintain some kind of a gatekeeper network um, to prevent people from listening to music unless they pay for it. Mm -hmm. But every step along the way toward that, there have been these defensive measures that the music industry has put in place and they've, every one of them has failed, you know. Um, when, when phonograph records first came out, the existing music industry was things like orchestras and uh, name singers and, uh, you know, touring musical acts that would have orchestral accompaniment or whatever. And um, that industry was terrified 
that if people could hear Caruso at home, then they would never come out to the opera house to see Caruso because they could just listen to Caruso at home, right? But what happened, of course, is that Caruso wasn't going to go to Ottumwa, Iowa, right? Or Dubuque or, you know, Cedar Rapids or, or whatever. But people in those places could hear Caruso in their homes and then they might make the trip to Chicago or Sioux Falls or whatever. And then it also might potentially spur a local, uh, a, a local entrepreneur to open up a, some kind of a small theater or opera house and then invite Caruso to come play in Cedar Rapids or whatever. Mm -hmm. and, and what their, the phonograph record did was it, in, it exposed a diasporous audience to music that they would never hear otherwise. And it created an entire new generation, and an entire new audience that was ravenous for music, right? Radio was exactly the same thing. When radio came in, all the band leaders were like, well, if they can hear Xavier Cugat from their living room, they're never going to come down to the ballroom to see him, right? But of course, what happened was that people would hear Xavier Cugat at home, and then they would read in the newspaper that Xavier Cugat was coming to their local pavilion or whatever, and then they would, you know, get on the coonskin coat and, you know, hubba hubba ding all the way down there and go watch Xavier Cugat. Like, it's like these, these defensive postures have all been incorrect. Right. You know, the cassette was supposed to be destroying music because people could make copies of their records for their friends. And what it did was it, it inf every cassette that somebody made and gave to a friend infected that friend with an enthusiasm for whatever was on that cassette. And so they sold a shit million more records because people were able to expose their friends in, in an inexpensive way. And uh, all of this stuff is, has held true. Like at every stage, the, the terror about a change in distribution has been matched by an explosion in the penetration of music into, like, before there was streaming, right? Mm -hmm. You had to go to a place where there was a hi-fi to hear music, or maybe you could hear it in your car, and that was it. And now you can hear music anywhere, right? If somebody mentions the name of a band, you can type it into your phone and be hearing their, their new song in a matter of seconds from anywhere in the, in the planet, right? That's amazing. That's yeah. an incredible development. That's so cool. Right? Uh, unbelievably yeah. cool, right? Stuff that was super marginalized and hidden and unknown is now broadly influential. And uh, like people whose careers were brief and, and non-illustrious have had revivals where they're now touring the world on the strength of the music that they made 30, 40 years ago that is now germane to the conversation because its influence has now like, been, been unlocked, right? That just seems like a tremendous development to me. Nobody's selling a huge number of records anymore. Mm -mm. And that's taken the power away from the record part of the music business. But people are listening to music constantly now and people are indulging their tastes in a really specific way. Like, you meet people who are into the weirdest assortment of shit, right? And they'll, if, you, if, if they're playing their playlist or whatever, every third song is something you've never heard of and you have no idea what the fuck it's all about, and, and, but they can explain it to you and then suddenly you're a fan of this guy, whatever, that you didn't know existed 10 minutes ago. Yeah. I, I think that's awesome. I think all of that stuff is awesome. I think specifically streaming as a mechanism is, it's got an expiration date. I don't know what it is, but it's going to disappear in the same way that CDs have disappeared. Mm -hmm. Like, the, the reason CDs supplanted LPs for a period was that they were more convenient. Like, you could get over an hour's worth of music on a CD and it was that big, and you could stack 10 of them up and then you'd have you know, 10 hours worth of music that was only an inch thick, right? Sure. And LPs, 10 hours worth of music would have been a couple of cases, right? Yeah. So much more convenient mm -hmm. for the moment, right? But much more convenient than that stack of CDs is nothing. Like that's way more convenient, you know? If you just, your phone that you have on you anyway is way more convenient than hauling around a CD player and a stack of CDs, right? So 
that's the, 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 the thing that causes the, the death of a convenience format is something more convenient than that. And because streaming platforms now have these encumbrances of like advertising and membership and you know, uh, having, to, having to register and give them your personal data and that sort of stuff, all of these encumbrances, I, I can totally envision a scenario where you don't have to do that, but you still get the functionality of just hearing music whenever you want it. So I can see that happening. And I think that that's the na natural next step from streaming. So I think streaming services, I don't know if any of you all are shareholders in any of the streaming services, but uh, I, think they're, I think those services are doomed, you know, yeah. just by the progression of technology that has made things progressively more and more convenient. And we're now at a way station where there is like some means of extracting money from people as a convenience. And I think that extraction is gonna be the thing that disappears next. Yeah, it's got to. I mean, a lot of the mu the money doesn't make its way back to the musicians anyways. It's the it never has. Companies, yeah. So. Essentially, none of the music makes it to the musician. Right. None, none no of the point. money makes its way to the artists. And that's, you know, intentional. That's sure, structurally, structurally intentional. Um, but I, that's not going to be the reason it, it collapses. The reason it collapses is because it's easier for people to do one thing than another. Mm -hmm. So... It, it's been seeming like there's been a resurgence in like people buying vinyl records. Yeah. What do you think about that? I think it's awesome. Um, what's great about it is that everybody recognizes the difference between um, a sort of ethereal or ephemeral music experience where you have a temporary, um, you know, you can listen to something in an informal setting for free in, a, you know, a, without, without having um, an artifact involved. But then if you want to make a collection of music that you can keep with you for life and move from place to place and potentially hand down to your kids or whatever, like people recognize that the, the, the way to do that is by buying records. And that also puts you in this continuum that goes all the way back to Thomas Edison and Caruso or whatever, where you can listen to the, the history of music in this one same format. Um, and I think that that's perfectly reasonable. I think it's sustainable. I don't know. I mean, there's no reason to think that people are ever going to buy records on the scale that they used to, where mm -hmm. people would buy, you know, you would sell millions of records. I just, that just doesn't seem reasonable that that, will, that would ever happen again. But I think that for, uh, you know, a discerning audience of people that want a physical copy of a record on a durable format, I think it's perfectly reasonable that small editions of basically everything are going to be a completely viable means, you know. Yeah, I mean, why would you buy a CD when you can have this thing you'll have forever? I mean, yeah, I mean, at, again, the convenience of CDs was their selling point, right? Not their, you know, sound quality or their beauty or their, you know, or their, you know, their presence as an object. So I think if you get an LP, which was always sort of considered the gold standard for preserving something over time and sound quality. And, and uh, I, I, I think people recognize the value mm -hmm. in that, and I think they always will. Um, there's been a trend in the manufacturing, like previously record pressing plants have been, were scaled up to produce, you know, tens of thousands of copies of a very popular title. And now it's rare that any title gets to those kinds of sales figures so that all the, all the pressing plants are now downsizing to the point where they can accommodate small quantities um, and independent labels typically operate on small quantities and that makes it possible for a smaller band now to press a record in an, in an economically viable way. That and the fact that the sale price of LPs has gone way up um, to, to compensate for the, the smaller numbers that are mm -hmm. being sold. Um, it seems like the business is kind of gravitating in a way that is going to be sustainable. Like the pressing plants don't require thousands to be pressed as a minimum order. They might require hundreds to be pressed as a minimum order. So that makes it viable for a small band or small label to do an addition, right? Um, and the record shop isn't selling LPs for $8.99. They're selling them for $12, $14, $18, $20, $24, $30, like whatever, mm -hmm. whatever is required to keep it sustainable. And people accept that that's the way that the that art form has gone is that it is now, you know, it now costs 
as much as lunch to buy a record, you yeah. know? And that, I think that's perfectly reasonable. Yeah. Well, I want to take things in another direction again. Um, something I really admire about you and electrical audio is your accessibility. Um, like, you're very affordable as far, like, you've worked with so many big names. Um, and you also just have a world-class studio. Uh, was there a conscious decision to keep it within reach of the normal band or normal yeah. person? Yeah. Well, yes and no. I mean, on one hand, um, I come from an underground background, and all of, all of my bands and all of my peers' bands were super conscious of how much money they were spending to record. And if, if the expense outstripped what seemed reasonable in the moment, they just wouldn't do it. And so we, I appreciate that if we, if we charge more than our client base can afford, we're not gonna, you know, they're not gonna go into debt to afford us, we're just gonna lose them as clients. And now there's a, there's a paradigm where anybody with a computer and a few hundred bucks can set himself up as a kind of a recording studio and you can get some version of a recording done for very low investment. So in order to justify coming into a proper studio with nice acoustics and trained engineers and expensive equipment and stuff, in order to justify that, then the, the qualitative leap needs to be extraordinary. Because if you can do it for free with your buddy Mike, or you're going to spend, you know, four, five, ten, twelve thousand dollars to do it in a studio, then you really need to be able to justify that expenditure because it's a, it's a significant sum, you know. So we've always tried to maintain an awareness of what, like what bands that were operating on the independent level could afford and tried to make sure that we always had availability to people on that level. Um, when I say we, I mean the whole, the, everybody that works at the studio, the, the way we, I wasn't using the royal we, the, the, <laughs> the, just the way that we operate as a studio, we want to maintain our utility as a resource for the whole of the music scene, which means that we have to be able to accommodate people that can only afford a few hundred dollars for their session. But we also need the capability to do an, ex an exceptional job for people that are going to deign to spend the money to come into a studio. Uh, just very quick economics lesson on running a studio. Um, we got a, a, a tape from a record label that needed to get a transfer made for a reissue project. And it was a studio in Chicago called Eight Track Studio. And it was in downtown Chicago in the, in the late 60s, early 70s. And they were advertising the fact that they had eight tracks available in the name of the studio. There were an eight, tra eight track studios. Nice. And there, the receipt for the session was inside the box. And they were charging $600 a day for their studio in 1969 or 1970, whenever it was. Um, and at the time that we were, that we got that, that uh, session in, we had just adjusted our rates down from $600 a day to $400 a day at our studio. So this would have been in the 20-somethings, like 2010, 2012, somewhere in there. Wow. And uh, so the, the, the amount of money that you're, in real terms that people were spending in the studio in the past was an, an order of magnitude more than people are spending now. Um, and that's a function of this thing that I described where it's easy to do recording at home now and it's easy to do recording in a semi-professional environment. So that's just put downward price pressure on all the professional studios. And if we, stu you know, if we stuck a stake in the ground and said, gosh darn it, we're worth $1,000 a day. You're gonna have to pay us $1,000 a day or go home. Then a, a significant portion of our clientele would just go home because they have, you know, they can get their buddy Mike to do it, right. you know. So we've had to be aware of that and keep our pricing so that people f still feel like they're getting a bargain. And, and I'll, I'm also, I'm not capitalistic about it. Like, I'm not, I, I don't, I'm not out to make maximum money for myself. Mm -hmm. 
for me, a success, the success of a business means that it survives. And that, you know, everyone that's employed there now remains employed next year. And the job that we're doing next year is at least as good as the job that we're doing now. And the satisfaction that everyone gets out of the process is at least as great as it is now. The bottom line really doesn't matter. As long as we can stay afloat, as long as we can, you know, keep the doors open, it's fine. I just, I don't subscribe to this notion that you have to constantly be making more money to, for it to be worth doing the thing that is your life's work anyway, you know? Right. You, you don't take, you've never taken money as like a production credit on an album, is that royalties, correct? Royalties, you mean, yeah. Ro royalties, yeah. yeah. Uh, yes, I haven't. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, that really speaks to your not being a mega capitalist right there. I mean, so yeah. many people would do that, especially on those bigger albums. Yeah, I think a lot of people really have flexible ethics when it comes to how much money they make. Like... I mean, and I'm not 100% immune to that. Like when I was in college, like right after I got out of college, I took a job as, uh, in, for a photo company that did advertising work. And our principal clients were Marlboro and Camel and Salem cigarettes. Like I, I would go to work every day and I would try to make these panoramic scenes more beautiful in the hopes that more people would smoke Marlboro, you know? Like, I mean, that's fucking perverse, right? That's, yeah, yeah. That's indefensible. Yeah. Like, I'm putting my skills, uh, you know, I'm, I'm getting paid and using my skills and my intelligence in it to try to coerce more people to smoke Marlboro. Like, that's <laughs> grotesque, right? So, but, so there's this, on one hand, like, everybody does, repra you know, things that are, that are not... 100% honorable for the sake of earning a living, right? right? And I justified it to myself because it allowed me to carry on doing the band and do all the other things that I was involved in. And so the fact that I was doing this reprehensible thing wasn't lost on me, but I also, you know, I acknowledged that I was doing that as, a, as, a, as an enabling mechanism, yeah. right? And I can see some other people in my position thinking the same way about an exploitative compensation scheme. And I, I just couldn't go that far myself. Like, the way record royalties work is that there's a sum, a percentage sum of the sale of each record that is allocated toward the royalties, right? From that sum are subtracted all of the origination costs of making the record and then all of the obligations that the band sees Beyond that, like various people involved in the production get their percentage points which are subtracted from the points that are available for the band. So in very crude terms, let's say there's 10 or 12 points available to pay royalties and their A&R guy gets a point and their lawyer gets a point and the producer gets two points. And before you know it, there's like three or four points left to pay the band. And that's after all the sometimes you know, a significant fraction of a million dollars has been siphoned out of that money in the first place as recoupable expense, right? And then that very small fraction of money is then diced up among the band members, and it's perfectly feasible that everyone involved in the process is getting paid more than the people mm -hmm. whose life's work is on that record. And I just didn't want to participate in that. Yeah. I just didn't want it to be on my mind. And in a very real way, the, the percentage points that I was not paid on any of those records went directly to the band because it's a zero-sum game. Like if I was paid some of their money, then it wouldn't go to them, right? Because right. yeah. my compensation would come out of theirs. And I just, I just, I just, I can't justify that. Ethically, I just can't justify that. So uh, I, the way I've always done it is we've just decided how much I should get paid to do the record and I'm paid that much, and I'm happy. And then I do the next record, and the same deal, you know. Um, and I, I know that at the time, other people in the industry thought I was foolish for doing things that way because I wasn't maximizing my earn on each of these records, right? But I sleep very soundly knowing that the people that I could have taken that money from, they got that money instead. I feel good about that. And also... I'm still here making records every day, and those people are all selling fucking insurance or something. Yeah. 
So, like, the way I do things has proven to be a sustainable, long-term viable option. And the exploitative method of just trying to maximize your earn at every moment, like, that's proven very destructive. Right. That's why the, indus the old music industry is collapsing in on I, itself. That's right? part of the inefficiency of it that has led to its collapse, yeah. Too many hands grabbing at that pie. Um. <laughs> I have, a, I have a kind of rule of thumb. I have a kind of rule of thumb. As a band, I've been in band since I've been a teenager, and you're, when you're in a band, they're always, you're always given these propositions, like somebody wants to do something for you, somebody wants you to do something, whatever. And my rule of thumb has been, if somebody wants to do some of my work for a percentage of what I would have gotten paid otherwise, then he's being overpaid. And the reason I know that is because he's willing to do that work for that percentage, and he wouldn't be if he wasn't getting an advantage out of it. So I should just do that work and keep all the money. Yeah. That's the way I've always perceived it. So um, things like having a booking agent or a manager or a lawyer, or any of those, all of those sort of functionaries mm -hmm. that are all siphoning money out of the system and making it more inefficient, if you can do away with all those people, then you need to earn much less money in order to maintain an existence, in order to, to carry on. Your overhead goes way, 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 way down when you have it, when, you're, it's not being, when your income's not being diluted by all these other people. That's, that's great. I mean, the DIY is a classic punk ethos, right? Sure. Do it yourself. I mean, make it happen. But yes, I, uh, I, I'm proud of the fact that we, the bands that I've been in, have maintained a lot of autonomy. Um, but I don't. But it's not so much philosophical, like that. I. It's not like a Protestant work ethic kind of thing where mm -hmm. I feel like it's better <laughs> if you, you know, hoe your own potatoes or whatever. Like I don't think that's what's going on. I just. It's just an, a matter of efficiency, and if you reject an inefficiency that is fostered and everyone else is indulging just because it's normal, if you can reject that, then you have an edge against everybody else. Like you can do things a little less expensively, you can make a little bit more, you can turn a little bit more profit or you can operate a little bit more efficiently and survive a little bit longer, you know. And so like everything that I've done as a band member or operating electrical audio or anything else in my life has been a matter of trying to winnow out these inefficiencies and do things in a way that allows me to keep doing them even if nobody likes it. Like, <laughs> if, even if my band doesn't sell any records, it's not gonna break, my, it's not gonna break us up if, if nobody likes our records. Or if we do a tour and not as many people come, it's not gonna be a, a catastrophe because we're operating efficiently enough that we don't need as much income on a daily basis, that sort of thing. That's really cool. Um, uh, kind of going back to the studio, what's, um, what's the weirdest thing that's happened in the studio that you can tell us about? That you can tell us about? Uh, I, I get asked this or similar questions often. Really? Yeah, but the problem is that it's actually, it's extremely mundane what happens in the studio. Like people show up, they record their music, there might be a few arguments about it, but everybody tries to avoid drama because drama is inefficient, you know? Um, I think if I worked on more records with like legit rock stars, then there would be more stories because rock stars have other people paying their bills and so they can, like if they wanna have a fight and throw chairs and that sort of stuff, they don't, aren't directly responsible for it. But, you know, some local band that's trying to knock a record out in two days, like, they just don't have time to have a fight. No. <laughs> you know? So, uh, I'm trying to think of something charming or interesting or funny. Has there been a most boring thing that's happened in the studio that you can tell us about? <laughs> most mundane? You know, just... <laughs> well, that's the thing. Like... If you don't work in the studio every day, if you don't see how mundane it is on a day-to-day -day basis, you imagine these fantastic scenarios where people are tripping balls and the lights are blinking and like you're, <laughs> you know, there's these epic jam sessions and every, you know, but. Sounds pretty inefficient. Generally speaking, 
people like they show up and they record their music and then they split. You know, like there's not really that much farting around. Um, there's, an, there's a really interesting book written by a guy named Phil Brown called Are We Still Rolling? And he's an engineer that worked on a bunch of records through the heyday of the record label system where ex exorbitant sums were being wasted in the studio. And he was in on a lot of these sessions where exorbitant sums were being wasted. And he did sessions for a band called Talk Talk who were kind of legendary and in their wastefulness. And like they would only record between midnight and 9 a.m. or something like that and like they their sessions were only illuminated by a color wheel and or a you know a lava lamp or something you know or the, you know they insisted on having all of their music recorded at a distance of 40 yards or something you know like just weird little things like that that kept him busy as an engineer like taking care of all the technical requirements to indulge all these fantastic notions and in the end the records are fine you know they're you know whatever they're records but uh, the amount of <clears throat> indulgence that was involved and in, that he documents in his book is, is kind of insane. Just to realize pe people would just set out on a course just where they knew they were, it was going to take them a year and a million pounds to make a record. And at the end of it, you know, you, yeah, you have a record. But you probably could have made that record in a week, you know? <laughs> and that, that's the sort of, like, I'm, I'm recommending that book because that's going to be way better stories than I could tell you. Deal, I'll go to the library, make that happen. Um, has there ever been a time somebody came into the studio and uh, changed your perspective or taught you something unexpected? That happens regularly, yeah. yeah. Um, we talked, we discussed a while ago about how, like my tastes as a listener, I have to kind of suspend all of that while I'm in the studio. Um, I've told this story before, but I'm, um, uh, when I first built a studio in my house, I, I had a studio that was in the basement of my house and I operated there for five years or so before I moved to electrical audio and started working out of there. But So um, this band came to record and they set up their gear in the basement in the playing room. And um, I'm not a drummer, but I routinely sit down at the drums and just twat around on the drums a little bit to see what they sound like. And so I get a mental image of what the drum kit sounds like for when I'm rigging the mics and stuff, I know what, I, what to expect, right? And this guy's drum kit was a disaster. Like the, the heads were really old and really dimpled, you know, and the snare drum had a divot in the head. Like most drum heads are flat or have a few dimples uh -huh. in it. His had like a sort of a fist-sized concavity oh. in the middle of it where he'd just been whacking it super hard for okay. years, right? <laughs> and it, when I'd hit it, it would just go, you know, just like <laughs> really an ugly and unusable sound. So I mentioned it to the band, like, you know, if you want to change the drum heads, we have spare drum heads here. I'm happy to change the drum heads on the drum kit because, you know, the drum heads look pretty bad. And the drummer was like, nah, it's fine. It's fine. I'm like, okay, uncle, whatever. <laughs> And then we started the sound check, you know, and he's playing the drums one at a time, you know, and the bass drum was sort of thud, thud, and the snare drum was like pat, pat, you know, not invigorating sounds. It, I, I suspected that it was going to be a long day and everything was going to sound bad and that it was going to be a circuitous process where, we, you know, at the end of the, this circuitous process, they finally capitulate and change the drum heads and then we go start from scratch again, right? So that's what I was expecting. But then they counted off the first song to record the, do a test recording of the band as a whole. And he started battering the drums and they sounded amazing. <laughs> it sounded just like it, he had, all of those divots were precisely where they needed to be for, to like, for his drumsticks to nestle into them perfectly. And I mean, it, it was a, a sea change moment for me that my notions of what make for a good instrument even are wrong. If, you know, that I need to fundamentally respect what comes in the door with the band, not just in terms of their aesthetic and their tastes and the style of music they want to play or how they want to go about it, but like the physical objects of the instruments that they're playing. You know, every single thing about them has probably settled in that way for a reason. And I should just, my first obligation shouldn't be to try to change anything. My first obligation should be to let them hear it the way it actually goes. And that, 
that, that one afternoon was instrumental in forming that notion for me as an engineer, where, where like, it's, it would be very easy for me to presumptively do damage to this band by just presumptuously thinking that they, the way that they were doing it already was incorrect, you know, and I have, I have to reserve that kind of judgment. And, uh, and I feel like that has served me really well over, over time because it, it lets bands have those distinctive elements that allows you to tell which band you're hearing when you're listening to a, a, a piece of music. Like you can tell, it, like I'm not the biggest Rolling Stones fan, but you can tell when Charlie Watts is playing, the, you can tell it's the Rolling Stones before you hear a single word of Mick, out of Mick Jagger's mouth, just because there's a super distinctive style to Charlie Watts' drumming, super distinctive rhythm guitar style that Keith Richards has, and those things are part of the personality of the band. And if you like the band, what you like are those things, right? So me stepping in and telling them to do it differently or changing those things is actually destructive. And I know it can be done with the best intent. You know, like I, I genuinely wanted to help when I was suggesting changing stuff, right? But that was, it was wrong. And I could very easily see a scenario where someone would indulge me because they thought I was trying to help out and it would actually have been a destructive influence. That's, that's beautiful. What's... 10 minutes for Q&A? Sweet. Um, well, we do have this paper full of questions. Can I read one off of here? Sure. This is the first one then. Um, let's see. There's a couple. I, now I have to pick. Um, wow, so many good questions. <laughs> um, how about what was it like to do the WTF podcast? Oh, the Mark Marin podcast. Uh, that's the one we're talking about, right? That's the WTF podcast. Does it, is there a podcast person out there? Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, I had heard a few of Mark Maron's podcasts, and I thought that his engagement with the people that he was interviewing was really great when he was on their level. Like, when he knew their, their game well, uh, it was, his interaction with them was great, and he drew out really interesting answers, and he let, you know, people were speaking, spoke really naturally with him, and I, I thought, it, thought it was good. And when I went there to do the podcast, I didn't know how versed he would be in music generally, or specifically stuff that I'd done. But uh, he was, you know, alert and attentive, and I felt like our conversation was really, like, genuine between him and me. And I, I felt like I was speaking to someone who was genuinely interested in knowing the things that he was asking about, and I thought our engagement was really good. And then when he stopped recording, it, it was as though, a, like, a, a sheet went up, and it was just like he, he wasn't even there anymore. And I, it was a little bit of a shock to see that somebody could be so different in their, like, professional capacity versus their personal capacity, but then I realized, like, if he had to pretend to be best buddies with every single person that he interviewed, that would just be exhausting on a psychic level. And so it's, it seems like he's developed a kind of a defense mechanism of just, like, having no interaction with you whatsoever unless it was, you know, the money shot on camera, you know? <laughs> like, everything else was just, like, completely formal and stiff and square. And, um, but I, I, all in all, I enjoyed... I enjoyed the experience, and he gave me a very nice coffee mug to take home. Sweet. Well, I guess I can't see anybody, but questions? I have a microphone. Thank you all for hanging out. This is, your patience is really remarkable. <clears throat> um, oh, that might time to quit. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Um, I was just wondering, because uh, I'm a big fan of yours, by the way, this is kind of terrifying for me. Uh, <laughs> because I am so mean. Because uh, um, you started Big Black in college and everything, and I've been having a lot of trouble starting a band in college so far. Any advice or whatever? Don't quit. 
when I, I was in a couple of bands and they didn't go anywhere and I could have quit then and then I started working on the music that was going to become Big Black on my own and I circulated a demo in my peer group to see if I could find people who would want to play with me and it, it didn't work. I couldn't find anybody that would play with me and uh, I could have quit then but I didn't. I pressed that up as a record and then released that record and through the process of releasing that record I met some other people that were interested in playing with me and then we started as a band and that became a functioning band and then the band persisted for five or ten years you know like and I could have quit at any of those points where it would seemed like things were not going well but uh, if you if you just don't quit eventually p other people will just give up and say okay fine you know I'll, <laughs> fine I'll be your drummer fine you know um, so yeah just don't don't quit. If, if you have ideas that you think are valuable, like if, you're, if you have a train of thought that you can pursue and is engaging to you the whole way, and you can communicate that with other people, and you can find people that think like you do, hang out with those people, and eventually you're going to find creative partners, people that want to do things with you, just because you think alike, just because you're, you know, compatible thinkers. That, that's my advice to everybody, is if you find people who are on your wavelength, just don't give up on them. Don't give up on the thing that you want to do. And, just, you know, if it takes 10 years, it takes 10 years. But, you know, it's, if you stop at any point, you will, you, it, then it's over. If you just refuse to stop, then it potentially could still kick off at any point. Thanks, and I'd also like to say thanks. I open a lot of my stand-up shows of an a cappella cover of Colombian necktie. So. <laughs> Other questions? Hi, I'd like to ask you a question about lyrical content of your songs. Okay. Uh, that's one thing I pay attention to a lot when I listen to music. And the first time I heard Shellac, um, I found that uh, the lyrical content of your guys' songs was very unique, you know, with. Uh, um, imagine a man so tall, all that stuff. I'm wondering, is that something, like, wh where does that come from? Like, wh where does lyrical content, or is that just an uh, excuse to, like, well, yell or something? To, to an extent, the lyrics are kind of uh, malleable. By that, I mean, like, we'll have a central notion for a song, what we want the song to be about, and there will normally be, like, a set of lyrics that we work from but a lot of them, the lyrics are subject to change. Um, like there's, there's a song called The End of Radio that was on our last album, or not our last album, but the one before that. And that song, the, all of the lyrics are extemporaneous. Like literally every single time we do it, we get started on a topic, on the topic of broadcasting and radio personalities. Because the idea of this song was that there is a, a class of celebrity that is the local radio personality, where there can be a guy that's literally f famous, but only in a prescribed area where his, his local radio station reaches, you know? Uh, and now that radio is becoming decentralized, or, and or it's becoming more centralized and, and less local, um, and radio as a, as a concept is now being supplanted by satellite broadcasting and stuff like that. So like local radio stations are now no longer as significant. We're witnessing like the, the, de the decline of a kind of celebrity um, and that there must still be local DJs that are sort of clinging to their identity of being famous within the Tri-Cities area or whatever, you know. Uh, and that the decay of that concept of celebrity and the the, the sense of loss for those people, but also like um, the, the cultural language is shifting away from radio as a, as a form of communication, and then there will, become a, there will come a point actually where there is no more terrestrial radio for entertainment, where people just don't do it anymore. Um, and so that's the, the, the thought train that is behind that song. Um, but the actual text of the lyrics are improvised. Um, and it can depend on what conversational topics we've had with the band. There are motifs that hang around for a few tours and then they disappear. And lately I've been doing 
something about podcasting as a substitute for radio. Um, and it's the principal thing is that that's the only place where you can reliably hear, hey guys, welcome back, is on podcasts. Like the beginning of every podcast starts with, hey guys, welcome back. And then almost every podcast also includes, please click like and subscribe. <laughs> And then there's a mention of their Patreon. So like those things have been cropping up a lot in that song, but who, there's gonna be something else. Like we're gonna, I'm, I might give up on those guys and move on to something else. But for the songs that are fixed lyrics, the lyrics are often uh, impressionistic um, fragments of a longer topic where if I were to try to express every part of the idea, it would be nonstop words and that would be really irritating. So we just pick like little talismans for each of these notions and express those and hope that that, that keeps our interest while we're doing it. I genuinely don't care if other people don't get it, um, but within the band, like I'd like to not embarrass myself in front of Bob and Todd. So. <laughs> Um, in terms of seeing so many bands come through your studio over the years and working with all these artists um, from what it sounds like a very wide array of backgrounds and musical styles, mm -hmm. what is what's so-called that magic or what do you see succeed in like unexpected ways across the board in a way that separates the people who make it from those who maybe just have a garage band? That's a really good question. There isn't any one thing that people can do to be successful, in finger quotes, or successful on their own terms even. But what I've found is that the people that, that whose records um, are successful in communicating their unique take on music are the people who trust their eccentricities and don't try to iron, out, iron them out. Um, real good example, um, Alan and Low, uh, Alan and Mimi from the band Low, their their two voices together, the two of them fit their voices together in an utterly unique way, and uh, they they have beautiful singing voices independently, but when they sing together, it forms this kind of a, a human instrument like an organ where their two voices fit together you know, like Lego blocks and then they become one thing. And that's a distinctive aspect of their singing style that has developed from their personal closeness and their willingness to trust that that's the way their voices work together as opposed to being an academically taught thing. I don't think you could teach anybody else to do that. Um, uh, there's a, a singer and fiddler named Galen Lee, who from also from Duluth, as a matter as it turns out, and she has a really distinctive, odd, spooky voice. But rather than try to clarify her voice or make her voice prettier or more conventionally narrow her the scope of her singing so that it doesn't reveal the eccentricities, she just uses it as a full spectrum instrument and lets the eccentricities pop out where they, where they will. Uh, and I find her singing absolutely gripping as a result. Just like the, the timbre of her voice is unique and the fact that she's using her full range as opposed to keeping it within the narrow range where the eccentricities won't be apparent, I think is, is brave on her part and it's also it's the thing that makes me listen to it, the thing that draws me into it. So, I guess in, in shorthand it would be if there's something unique or something that's, uh, that's yours and yours alone about your music, if there's something that you do that's a, uh, whether it's, whether it might be considered academically good or bad, if nobody else does that and you build that into your persona as a performer, then it allows people to appreciate what is unique about you and the thing that makes them come back to you is this thing that they can't find anywhere else. Um, and I, that's, that's, I think, would be the common thread among the people that I've worked with that have a really um, strong body of work is that they've trusted 
their eccentricities and the things that make them distinctive and unique from other people. And they haven't tried to polish them out and make themselves, you know, more conventional or more mundane, you know. Okay, we have maybe time for one more. Thanks. Hi, I don't have a question, but I do have a comment. Um, as soon as I find my seat without falling on my ass. Um, so just going back to when you were talking about the lyrical question, um, <laughs> I'm actually uh, a host of a program at our local public radio station, and not only a host at a radio station in 2019, but I'm the classical music host, so I'm like double fucked. Just kidding. <laughs> um, but at the same time, everything you were saying about radio is exactly what I wish you could tell like the people that I'm employed with. So I guess my question is, do you want to record a podcast? <laughs> you know, I get asked about doing a podcast once in a while. and Mostly just joking, but... Oh. <laughs> well, well I, I guess what it boils down to is I'm... There may, only, there may only be one dude left that doesn't have a podcast, and I'm fine with it being me, you know? Um, and the other thing is that I'm a total podcast whore in that I, if anybody wants me to be on their podcast, I pretty much always say yes. So I get the satisfaction of having been on podcasts without the, the sort of crushing effect of watching my listenership decline over time of having my own podcast. So uh, I feel like I get the best of both worlds by never having to do a podcast. I'm relieved of that as an obligation. But also, whenever anybody wants me to do their podcast, I can say yes. So, I, I think that was an answer. <laughs> okay, I think we're pretty much wrapped up now. Uh, just two quick announcements. We are doing a short after party at the Ordoc, uh, 9 p.m. Uh, you're welcome to come. Everybody's welcome. Um, last little bit to say hurrah, um, if you're not exhausted already. Um, and uh, the merch will still be on sale until nine o'clock. So if you want, if there's any last items you want to get tonight, uh, feel free. Otherwise, thanks for coming out.